Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Prior to our waxing procedures, we would like to make some checks of the articulator and also the articulated models to make sure that they're in the proper relationship and also that the articulator has been programmed. In this particular bridge, we've actually destroyed the guidance that the patient presented us with since we've reduced the la uh, lingual aspect of the cuspid. So it'll be necessary to set the incisal table, the lateral wings, and also the protrusive guidance to simulate what the patient had if we would like to uh, continue this in our final restoration or make whatever changes uh, are deemed necessary for the health of the dentition. So we have set the lateral guidance off of the uncut casts to give us the proper form of the lingual aspect of the cuspid and also our incisal guidance so that uh, we have sufficient clearance in the incisal uh, excursion. It may be necessary on these particular models if there isn't sufficient room to reduce some of these lower anterior teeth in the inc incisor area and also the uh, lower uh, cuspid to afford us room for our wax up and on the central afford us not only room for the wax up but also the uh, porcelain veneer that will be applied to this restoration. The first thing we'd like to check is to make sure that our dies are seated properly and that we have no movement in them and as you can see they're well seated and uh, we would also like to mark the margins on our preparation with a waterproof pen which I have already done, so that we are sure where our margins are. Now on the cuspid, you'll notice that we have some reverse beveling on the distal aspect to protect this incisal edge, so we would like to incorporate this obviously in our wax up. And we have marked our margin all the way around the lingual aspect. Now on this veneer type preparation, on the cuspid, it will not be necessary to put on a uh, die spacer as we have done on the central. Check the articulator for adjustment. Set the wings on the incisal table for lateral guidance. Set protrusive guidance. Check the dies. Make sure they seat properly, no movement present, and mark all the margins with a Sharpie's pen. On the central die, as you'll notice, we have added some die spacer to give us some relief for our cement. And we've kept it off of the marginal area and left approximately uh, on the labial aspect, three quarters of a millimeter short of the margin, not covering the, the shoulder. And on the lingual, uh, again, approximately three quarters of a millimeter up from the margin. Since the metal and the dyes, as we said previously, acts as a heat sink, we would like to add, if we can, enough wax around the peripheral area of this dye at one time so that as the wax cools, it actually shrinks against the metal rather than uh, pulling away from the metal as it cools. So our first application of wax We'll get it relatively warm and try, if there's enough on the spatula, to completely girdle the, the dye with some wax. Although it hasn't completely covered the uh, entire dye, we have applied enough wax so that as it chills, as I say, it will contract against the dye. And now, once this is chilled, why we can go ahead and, and start building 
up our wax up to our full contour and first we're obviously laying on a layer of, of soft green wax to the dye and then we'll use our regular slightly harder green wax to wax it to as I said a, a full full contour. Wax up. Apply two coats of dye spacer to the dye. Apply enough wax to completely encompass the periphery of the preparation. Wax to the full contour. Scribe the cutback area and have your instructor check it before doing the actual cutback. We've uh, rough waxed this to its, its full contour now and we'd like to put it back on the articulator with the Ponic to check not only its final shape but also whether we have sufficient amount of material to uh, allow us to get a, a, a good contact. And uh, as you can see, the full wax up is quite similar to the tooth adjacent to it. And we have a sufficient bulk of wax there. I've over waxed it to some degree so that we can, after we do our cutback, have a good contact between the ponic and the wax coping. Now what we would like to do ideally is to have approximately two millimeters of clearance between the incisal edge and the top of our wax symbol for ceramic so that we have a translucent area on the incisal edge and then interproximately we're going to cut this back quite a way so again we have a bulk of porcelain there which will give us some translucency and then on the distal aspect we'll have to cut back our wax so that it harmonizes with our ponic and we have a area of metal coming up interproximately which will allow us to complete our solder joint between the central and the ponic when we have the castings. So the first thing we'll want to do is to either estimate or take a Boley gauge that uh, has had the points sharpened and set it at two millimeters and then we can either just set it here and scribe a line across for two millimeters or we can just put a couple of small marks on there to give us a guide where our two millimeter cutback is going to come to which will be approximately into this area and then we would like to have approximately one millimeter of margin left here on the labial aspect and then interproximally we would like to cut as I said down and around and back so that we retain this area of the wax for our solder joint and then looking at the lingual aspect we have a decision as to whether we want our occlusion to be on metal or on ceramic and in this particular uh, dentition the opposing lower central hits up in this area which is very close to the incisal edge it would be difficult to bring metal up this high and still maintain this translucent incisal edge that we would like to have so we're going to cut the wax back lower into this area and have our opposing cast articulate on ceramic rather than on metal and this will also afford us the uh, ability to 
drop our cutback low in approximately on the mesial aspect and to maintain this bulk of porcelain in approximately to give us uh, more translucency and vibrance in this area. The main consideration with where the joint goes is that we don't want it to be exactly at the centric stop area. Uh, if we did put our porcelain and metal interface right here where the opposing cast contacts this tooth, there would be the danger of fracturing the porcelain off. So we either want the centric stop to be in porcelain or in metal. Uh, there's nothing prohibitive to have it in metal and have the disclusion right across that joint. However, as I say, having it exactly where the interface is is uh, not recommended since uh, this does lead to the possibility of future uh, fracture. Uh, after we've marked out these areas and had them checked by our instructor, uh, then we can start our, our cut back this labial aspect and cut this back so that we have a thickness of approximately a half a millimeter all in this area where our, our ceramic material is going. And as I said, we would like to maintain approximately one millimeter of marginal area here, uh, which will be subsequently cut back to about a half a millimeter in the metal. However, we'd like to maintain about a millimeter so that uh, it's uh, easier for us to uh, uh, cast. Uh, half a millimeter makes it uh, much more difficult, especially with this thin facial surface of metal. Uh, it's difficult to get the metal to flow down through the sprue across this facial surface, surface and uh, maintain a, uh, a marginal integrity complete in the casting with uh, such a thin pathway for the metal to uh, traverse. Cut back wax up. Check margin adaptation. Put depth cuts on the labial surface. Maintain maximum contact area with the ponic for ease of soldering. Check the thickness of the cutback. Approximately one half millimeter on the labial, one millimeter retained marginal area, and one and a half to two millimeter reduction on the incisal. First thing we'll do is to uh, remove the incisal edge. And then we'll move, remove some of the interproximal area. And then we will start our, our cut back. Periodically checking the thickness to make sure that we don't go beyond a half millimeter. We'll continue cutting back the surface until we get back to approximately a half a millimeter. And then I would suggest that in order to get a good rounded area at the interface between the metal and the porcelain, you might consider using a small excavator spoon variety and get in and clean this marginal area up and this will give you the proper radius and contour in this area. And we'll just continue doing this technique until we've generated the type of pattern that we would like to have. Uh, we've finished our, our cut back and our wax up now uh, to a point where we can uh, make some checks on it and make sure that we have uh, the desired contour. As you can see, I've, I've cut back the incisal edge approximately two millimeters, so we have room for our ceramic in this area. The facial surface has been cut back to approximately a half a millimeter. We've maintained about a millimeter at the marginal area. And on the, the distal aspect, you can see that we've brought a tongue 
of wax up into this area, and this is our contact with our PONIC. I've subsequently put it on the articulator and checked the PONIC, and uh, I'll show you that momentarily, that we have maintained this area of metal so that we can get a reasonably good solder joint there. On the lingual aspect, you can see that we've cut this back. Again, we have approximately a half a millimeter of wax here for our metal. Cut it back in a sloping direction. And remember, our centric stop is going to be up in this area close to the incisal edge, so it will be in ceramic. We've come around interproximally on the mesial aspect, kept this low in this area so that we can maintain a maximum amount of ceramic at the inter interproximal area on, on the mesial for maximum aesthetics. To check the, the thickness of this labial surface, we'll use the micrometer that uh, you had in your kit. And for this particular demonstration, I have a, a dial type, which will show up a little better on the television screen. So we'll have to carefully remove our wax up from our die. And obviously, we're going to be checking this as we do our wax up. And we can check the, the thickness of this. with our micrometer, and you can see that we have exactly a half a millimeter thickness on this labial surface. And we've got slightly more. And just slightly more than a half a millimeter in that area. And then we can also check the labial aspect of this, and we've got about a millimeter there, so we can thin that out slightly. And we've got, obviously, a bulk of, of metal down here over a half a millimeter. So we're very close to being where we would like to be with our, our finished wax up. And uh, now we'll put this back on and put it back on the articulator. and check our PONIC to make sure that our contact area is in its proper location. We've positioned the, uh, the wax up back on the die and the die uh, on the model and uh, have the PONIC in place. And you can see interproximally here where the uh, wax comes up and it just covers the metal that's available interproximally on the PONIC so that we should take advantage of as much metal as we have there to give us as strong a solder joint as possible. Uh, you'll notice that we have quite a, an area of ceramic available interproximally against the adjacent central, which will allow us to uh, create some maximum aesthetics there. And we also have our two millimeters on our incisal edge for our translucency that we would like to have. We've maintained approximately one millimeter of metal at the marginal area for castability. And now after we do a few little small things to clean our wax up, up and uh, make it ready for sprueing and casting, uh, we should be ready to uh, carry on with our sprueing and investing procedures. After having removed the impression pins from the die, we're uh, ready to take our knurled wire and clean out the pinholes prior to uh, our starting of our wax up. You'll find that in a small brown envelope, you've received some knurled wire approximately this long and the envelope may say uh, Ponto wire or Iridium platinum wire or knurled wire on it, one of these uh, three designations, probably Ponto wire, 0.026 inches in diameter. 
before we cut this into five equal lengths, approximately five millimeters long, since this is knurled, we would like to insert it in each of the pinholes, and since this will act as more or less of a file, we can move this up and down several times to rid the pinhole of any burrs that might have been there so uh, we can remove the wire much easier uh, after we have performed our wax up procedures. So we'll cut this wire, as I said, into uh, five equal lengths of five millimeters long. And if we cut, the, cut this with a uh, carborundum disc, it'll be necessary to go back and the area that's been cut to smooth off any small burrs that may have uh, been left on the cutting edge of uh, the uh, wire so that they don't uh, catch as we try to move, remove them from the pinholes. After we have cut these to, to size, we'll have, as I said, a series of three of these, approximately this long, and we'll now lubricate the dye in preparation for the wax-up procedure. Placement of retention pins. Clean pinholes with the knurled wire. Cut the knurled wire into three pieces approximately five millimeters long. Smooth the cut ends to remove any residual burrs. Since we're going to use Duralay first, in the area that will encompass the three pins, it will be necessary to use uh, the Duralay lubricant or, uh, if this is not available, Vaseline. Uh, don't use KY jelly since that's water soluble or one of the uh, other materials such as liquid pentholatum or your regular dye lubricant. Use either the Duralay uh, material or uh, Vaseline. and wipe off the residuals so that there uh, is no large amount of material left. So using a, uh, a cotton swab or some other suitable applicator, we'll lubricate this area on the dye and remove any of the residual Vaseline that's left. And now we're ready to, to place our pins. The reason for lubricating prior to putting on the pins uh, is so that we don't get any of the lubricant on the, the knurled wire uh, that would likely inhibit the Duralay from attaching to it because basically what the application of Duralay is going to do is going to loop together the three pins so that we can lift them all off uh, in unison. Uh, as you can see, we placed the, the three pieces of knurled Ponto wire in uh, their appropriate holes, and obviously they all line up. And now we'll take a fine brush and pick up a, a rather large amount of Duralay and place it there, and then we can go back with our liquid and re-wet it and move it around into the area where we want it rather than having it run over the whole, whole surface. And basically what we would like to do would be to get the, the pins completely encircled by the, the Duralay material so that they're supported well in the material and won't pull out when we attempt to remove this portion of the, the pattern. Now that's a sufficient amount of material. We might add just a, a small increment up in this incisal area here. That's a sufficient amount of material and now we'll let this completely polymerize and then we'll tease it off and check our alignment of our pins and continue with our 
waxing procedure. Application of Duralay. Lubricate the dye with pins removed. Use a clean brush. Apply Duralay and wet to spread over the surface of the dye. Allow the Duralay to polymerize prior to removal. The Duralay is now polymerized and we would like to remove it, uh, obviously all in one piece. But rather than grabbing one of the pins with a hemostat and attempting to pull it out, it would be better to take a sharp instrument such as this or a scalpel and get under one of the corners of the Duralay and gently tease it until we break it loose, as we've done here, and then we can very easily remove it all in one piece. Now we can go back with either a pair of forceps or another suitable instrument and gently tease it off the, off the die. And we have it removed and we'll check the under surface to make sure that we have all of the anatomical features captured. And obviously this came off relatively easily so we'd suspect that it would go on with the same degree of ease. And we can reinsert it and uh, recheck it. But prior to reinserting I'd like to re-lubricate the dye before we continue with our wax up. Removal of Duralay. Tease a Duralay loose with a sharp instrument. Inspect for close adaptation. Relubricate the dye with dye lube. Firmly reseat Duralay pattern. We've relubricated the dye with uh, dye lube and repositioned the small matrix with the pins and we want to make sure that we've got it completely seated because if there's any space obviously between it and the die why we're going to have a, uh, a small void there and before putting our regular wax on it's advisable to take a very small amount of sticky wax and put a very very thin layer over the the Duralay. This will cause the subsequent wax up to adhere to the Duralay and there will be less chance of it separating from the wax up when uh, the pattern is removed from the dye. We can now proceed with normal technique for waxing the, the rest of the dye. We can apply some regular wax directly over the top of the, the Duralay and the, uh, the rest of the dye and wax it to its, its completed contour. Before we finish up our wax up, we want to go back to the articulator and obviously with these knurled wire pins protruding from the dye it's going to be difficult to move it into lateral excursions and also establish our, our centric stops, but we would like to, if possible, at least approximate our centric stops and since the articulator has been set to a long centric type of disclusion, perhaps if we elect to, to put a rest on the lingual aspect of this so that we can maintain that guidance that's on the articulator. We've added the bulk of the wax to the die now and we'll check it on the articulator make sure that we've got a sufficient amount of wax to give us a centric stop area and we do have a a centric stop in the wax and it's sufficiently broad to allow for our anterior posterior guidance 
and give us a, a, a centric stop in both centric occlusion and centric relation. And now we'll continue to refine the wax up and uh, check it to make sure that it's easily removable from the die. And one thing about wax, it's rather unique material in that in the chill state, obviously, it's, it's a solid and, and a liquid uh, when heated to a sufficient temperature. And if we just warm our waxing instrument when we're ready to do our, our final adjustment on our margin so that we can simply render the wax to more or less a plastic consistency, we can burnish it against the margin without melting it and get a very, very, very close adaptation to the metal die. Because remember, the metal acts as a heat sink, and if we put too much heat on the die, or on the wax, rather, it's simply going to move away and uh, we'll end up with a, uh, a margin that's going to be short in our casting. At, uh, at this point, I very strongly recommend that you get some type of magnification so that you can check after you're done waxing to make sure that indeed you have waxed and bulked the margins uh, to their complete fullness so that uh, you don't end up with a, uh, a short margin in the casting. We'll now refine our wax up. We've completed the wax up of the pin ledge and we will try it back on the articulated model to make sure that the podic fits properly prior to uh, investing it. We'll place the podic back into position to check and see that we have room between the contacts. And we would like to have them just a little bit heavy so that we have some additional metals available for our finishing. And as you can see, it, it fits into the space relatively well. So we're ready to sprue our pin ledge now. Wax up. Apply a thin layer of sticky wax to the Duralay. Wax the die to completed shape. Check for centric stop. Refine margins. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.